Hello and good morning. Today we are talking about the truth that is hidden from our society about anxiety. So if you're struggling with anxiety and you don't know what to do and you don't know where to turn or you don't know how to deal with it and you keep fighting and fighting and fighting and it never seems to go anywhere, today's show is all for you. We're going to go through a presentation that I have worked out for you all about anxiety and some of the things that I've dealt with anxiety. Uh, for example, when I was at the height of my drinking, I was so anxious I couldn't even go outside. I couldn't go get the mail, which was like not that far away, couldn't walk across the street, couldn't go to the store, couldn't do just about anything because I had this crippling anxiety. Now this was also in my family. My dad suffered really bad with anxiety, uh, so much so that he didn't leave the house for two years. He actually had his own business and had the clients come to the house to sign the papers and they went and saw houses themselves and things like that. Really, really crazy. And anxiety is something that really cripples our society. And it's something that's really mainstream and really common. And if you're struggling with it, I want you to know that you're not alone. I've struggled with it. Lots of other people have struggled with it. And this is something that you can move through. Now, notice that I didn't say something you can conquer or something you could fight or something you could deal with, right? Those are not the terms that we want to use when it comes to anxiety, because the more we fight, the worse it gets. And I think you've probably figured this out by now when you're dealing with anxiety. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all the things that comprise and make up anxiety. We're going to talk to you about the things that I've used to reduce my anxiety drastically, most of the times as much as like 99%. Now, of course, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a trained physician, I'm not a therapist, but these are things that I've used and I've found work for me. And I think a lot of people on this channel have found that they work for them as well. So let's first talk about some of the things that comprise anxiety. If we could keep our microphone on, that would be good. Some of the things that comprise anxiety. Uh, some of the things that you're going to look at are food, drink, sleep, social, status, environmental, moral and spiritual, OCD, and of course, lastly, we have the working of the mind. Now, what do I mean by this stuff and how does it fit into our daily life and how is this gonna help us with anxiety, whether we're alcoholics and drinking or whether we're just someone here that's new that's like, what's with this whole anxiety thing and how do I get rid of it? Now, first of all, we wanna realize that anxiety is a chemical response in our body. That's all it is, nothing more, nothing less. Now, this chemical response can be triggered several ways. Number one, it can be triggered by food and drink. Obviously, if you drink alcohol, it makes you feel like your anxiety has gone down. Now, this is an illusion because what's happening is alcohol is actually dropping the base level of anxiety. So if you start out and you're like, hey man, I, I'm, I'm kind of anxious. I'm like right here at like a number 10 on the anxiety scale. What happens is you have your drink, right? You drink here and then it drops down and you're like, man, I'm feeling pretty good. I have like zero anxiety. This is great. Drinking really, really helps. And then when you're done drinking, you're going to notice that your baseline's going to shoot up and you're like, man, I'm not like a 20 now. What the hell's going on? And then you're going to drink and you're probably going to go to like a number five, right? And what happens is your body now gets immune to it and the higher it's going to get. And you're probably going to get where I got, where if you keep drinking to relieve your anxiety, pretty soon your anxiety is going to be off the chart and drinking is just going to make you barely feel normal. And this is a trap that a lot of people get caught un into when they deal with anxiety. So when I say that food and chemicals affect it, this is very, very important. Having the proper diet is obviously going to uh, uh, affect your anxiety. Drinking, uh, Americans wonder why we're the most anxious culture and it's because we have coffee cups that are this size, right? That's like, that's huge. Or, or for example, let me get another one to show you what it's like, right? Here we go. This is a typical, this would be a typical American coffee cup here, right? Gigantic. And we wonder why we're so full of anxiety. And it's because, hey, you know what? You're drinking a bunch of coffee and coffee is a stimulant. It stimulates you. So what I notice is that when I have too much coffee or even any amount of coffee, I find that decaf usually works best for me, my anxiety is off the chart. Now, a lot of people don't realize this because what happens is we're not putting the link together between food and drink and our anxiety. Very, very important, but this is a very big thing. Another thing that affects your anxiety is sleep. Are you getting enough sleep? I notice that if I get like four hours of sleep, I wake up pretty anxious. 
if I get like six hours, I'm feeling pretty good. If I sleep too much, then I also have too much anxiety. So we got to look at this and we got to be like, okay, how is this affecting us? So we got our food, we got our drinks, right? Whether it's alcohol that we're using to dampen our anxiety or whether it's coffee we're using to wake up. Now, here's a little secret that I found out when I switched to decaf coffee. I used to think that when I woke up, I would need coffee to wake me up. And so I'd have coffee, 15 minutes later, I'd be awake. Then when I switched to decaf or nothing at all, I found out I woke up, I was tired. No matter what I did, 15 minutes later, I was awake. So it wasn't the coffee that was actually doing it, it was actually the 15 minutes. Same thing I found with anxiety and drinking. When I would go somewhere that I knew I was going to be anxious, I would drink alcohol. And I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna drink alcohol because it's gonna calm me down. 15 minutes later, I'd started to calm down. When I quit drinking, I noticed that I went into those situations and without drinking, within 15 minutes, my anxiety started to drop. So we got food, we got drink, we got sleep. We also have social. Right? A lot of people have social anxiety, that is anxiety around other people or anxiety in groups. Now this usually, we're going to talk to this, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but this is usually something to do with a inner conflict in your life. It's usually something where you don't accept yourself, you don't think you're good enough, you don't think you measure up, and you've bought into all of society's bullshit, right? Which brings us into the next thing, which is status. Now, it's very important that if you're dealing with social or status anxiety, check out the video that I have here on the channel. Make sure you subscribe, give this a thumbs up, and check out the video where I talk about is anxiety a symptom of something bigger? Because I think there's something bigger going on here because if you go into other cultures, they're not nearly as high wire anxious as we are here in America or in Western cultures. Now, social is very important. Usually social has to do with the hardwiring of our brain to make people like us. We have this craving. We have a, an addiction to the drug called accept me, like me, think of me. And we have this addiction where we're looking at it and we're like, I need to get people to like me. I need to get people to accept me. I need to, to show something to the world. I need to prove that I'm worth it. And what happens is with the social stuff and the status, we're constantly trying to prove this. Now, the interesting thing about anxiety, and this is something that uh, I go back and forth with lots of people that I talk to about it. Now, I believe that anxiety starts first as a chemical. Right now, it can start first as a thought as well. A thought can produce a chemical. But what happens is our brains work so fast that when things have happened to us, maybe you've been abused, maybe you've struggled with something, maybe people were wrong to you, maybe you were like me and you got bullied in school and things like that, and you know, it, it, it takes a toll on you. And so you look at that, and what happens is your mind now wires itself for protection. So if you grew up as a kid and, and things happened to you and you were struggling and you were having a hard time, right? What happens is your brain hardwired itself and said, I need to watch out for these things. And it built a list of these things. And it might say, well, people that are tall, if it was someone who was tall that bothered you, or people with a beard, if it's someone with a beard who bothered you, or, or people with glasses or, or these kind of people or whatever. And what happens is your brain hardwired it. And it said, these are the things that we need to look out for, right? And when you were a kid, it was good because you're like, yeah, okay, the, the kid with the, the funny shoes used to come up and kick me. So anytime I see those shoes, I get anxious. Now, it's not like something you think about. It's not like you sit there and go, gee, Nike pumps or whatever they are, right? I don't know if you remember the, the pump shoes. Those were big when we were kids, right? The, the pump them up and play basketball or whatever. Uh, maybe, maybe I get anxious and you see those and it's not like you think about it. It's not like a thought occurs. It just, boom, triggers the emotion in your body. And it triggers the emotion and the chemical of anxiety. And when that raises, you get the flight or fight response where you say, I need to get the hell out of here. And even if you're sitting still saying, I know there's no danger, I, I don't know why I'm freaking out. I don't know what's going on. What's happening is your brain has been hardwired to say, danger, danger, danger. You need to get out of here. And it produces a chemical so that you're ready to do that. Very important. So we have social, we have status. We also have environmental. 
a lot of people right now are flipping out and they're anxious about coronavirus. And they're like, what are we gonna do about coronavirus? Coronavirus is crazy. And we don't look at it logically and we don't look at it in terms of what are we gonna do? We just kind of flip out and the news is great at helping us flip out. It absolutely helps us flip out, right? Uh, probably best to not watch the news if you're super anxious, just read snippets, right? Um, but environmental is a big thing. It could be the economy's not doing good, uh, money's tight, uh, people are getting sick or whatever it is, right? So we got food and these are all the things that affect your anxiety. Food, drink, sleep, social, status, environmental. Next, we have moral and spiritual. Moral and spiritual is very interesting, right? Because we're going to look at this and it's like, well, how do you have moral and spiritual anxiety? Well, moral and spiritual anxiety all have to do with what you think of yourself. Now, a lot of times, if you grew up in a church like I did, where they were very guilt-driven, it's like you do these things, you're a terrible person. If you think this stuff, you're a terrible person. And what happens is you try to be the quote unquote good person. And you realize that, you know, these standards that are set up that weren't invented by me or weren't invented by you. They're just things that society says are what we need. What happens is we start to try to live by these and we get anxiety about not measuring up. And it's very important. Because when we look at this, we try to be perfect. We try to deal with things on our own way. We wonder why we have anxiety. We wonder what's wrong with us. And I remember for years, I used to think, what's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why do I get anxious in, in, in these situations? Why am I anxious all the time? Why do I not feel good enough? Why do I keep doing things that I know go against the grain of what I believe or whatever it is, right? And moral and spiritual anxiety is very interesting. And we're gonna to talk to you about how to deal with all these. We're gonna to talk to you about how to calm your mind and start to understand this stuff. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna to start to see that you can make your anxiety levels drop and you can make them drop extremely fast. Next up, we have OCD. Uh, OCD is an important one. This is obsessive compulsive disorder. This is where you constantly obsess about certain things. A uh, very good book on OCD is called The Imp of the Mind. Um, very good uh, book that was written on that. I, I like that one a lot because it talks about how our mind works when we're in obsessive compulsive disorder. Next up, we have the working of the mind. Now this by far is the most important. Okay, when you look at the working of your mind, we wanna look at that and say, well, how does my mind work? Because if we could separate the working of the mind from the content, try to write sideways here, right? Working of mind from content, everything's gonna start to change because here's the deal. All of this stuff here affects the working of your mind. If you have the wrong food, and your body gets anxious, that's gonna affect the working of your mind, the way your mind works. Now, when we're looking at this, right, the working of your mind has to do with the way that your mind processes thoughts, the way you think about things, and the way your thoughts work, right? This is the fundamental way my thoughts work. Now, if you have OCD, that means that your thoughts work, your mind works in an OCD fashion. That's what it's going to do because that's what it's gonna do. If you are like the kid who got bullied, like me, and your mind is working on protection mode, and you're saying, I gotta be on the lookout, I gotta protect myself, that guy over there, he could come over here and hit me, so I need to be ready. This guy over here can do this, so I need to be ready. What happens is all of this stuff affects the working of your mind. Now, some of it, like food, drink, sleep, um, food, drink, sleep, and moral and spiritual, these are temporary, right? These are temporary ones. Environmental is also temporary. Status, social, these are temporary. Uh, OCD is more of a, a, a long-term one, right? Because that's another thing you got to deal with. But all these things up here are temporary. So you could change your food. You could change your drinks. If you're drinking too much alcohol and you find your anxiety going off the chart, you know, maybe it's time to quit alcohol. Uh, and get to a baseline again. Now, when you quit alcohol, uh, your anxiety in the beginning of quitting is gonna be off the chart. But again, it's gonna be very important to understand that anxiety comes from the working of your mind. If you have a working, anxious mind, 
no matter what happens, you're going to be anxious. It could be coronavirus or it could be Bud Light virus or whatever the hell it is. No matter what, you're going to be anxious about it. It's like Alan Watts says, if you're the worrying type, you're always going to find something to worry about. You say, Marcus, you don't understand. I got money trouble. If I hit the lotto, then I wouldn't be anxious. Well, I guarantee if you hit the lotto, then you'd be anxious about keeping your money, right? It's always going to be there because if your mind works this way, that's what's going to happen. Now, the food, the drink, the sleep, the social, all this stuff can be changed. All this stuff can be changed with a different life philosophy. Okay, what is your life philosophy and with knowledge? Okay, so how does this work? Well, first of all, we need to understand the difference between the working of the mind and the content of the mind. So let's see if our microphone will reach over here. All right, the working of the mind versus the content of the mind. So your working of your mind is the way the thoughts process, okay? The content is like coronavirus. Corona, there we go, that says corona. Uh, whatever other virus. Uh, you got money. You got uh, relationships. You got um, jobs. You got social, right? You have a lot of this stuff that's going on that affects the content, okay? Now you give your brain something to think about and it's gonna chew on it. It's gonna chew on it with the way that your brain's been taught to work. Okay, here in Western culture, the working of our brains is to be anxious. We gotta live in New York, we gotta walk fast, we gotta do this. You gotta live in San Francisco, you gotta walk fast, you gotta make money, you gotta grind all day. We have taught our brains to work this way. Now, the cool thing about this is you could change the way your mind works because there's a thing called neuroplasticity. What this is, is it means that our brains can change by repetitive things. So you have trained your brain to, to be a certain way. Now, up until now, if you're anything like me, you didn't sit down and say, dear brain, I'd like you to be a fucking mess, right? We didn't sit down and say, I'd like you to be a mess. I want to be anxious all the time. What happened was it just came upon us and it came upon us subtly through spiritual stuff, society stuff, through uh, other people affecting us. Now, the cool thing about this is we can change it, but here's where it will not be able to change. If you take the content and it goes into your brain and you're like, okay, here's the content. I'm worried about the Corona virus and I'm stressed out about it. And I'm going to stress about it all day. And you say, Marcus, you don't understand. This is about the virus. That's why I'm worried. No, 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 no. That's where you're wrong. You're worried because the working of your mind is programmed and predisposed to worry. It doesn't matter what I put over here the news could completely make something up. And I'm not saying they are, sometimes they do, but they could completely make something up and you're gonna go for it. If there's nothing, if you turn on the news and they say the world is perfect, everyone is kind, everyone has food to eat, the world is perfect, you're still gonna find something to worry about because that's how your mind works. Now, how do we combat this? How do we look at this? First, we have to have the understanding to say, no matter what I'm thinking about, no matter what I'm obsessing about, no matter what I'm anxious about, that's my brain doing its thing. That's all it's doing. It's just doing its thing. That's what's going to happen, right? Anxious people get anxious. That's, that's, what, the, that's what happens. Uh, worried people get worried. That's what happens, okay? So we need to stop giving credit to the content because the content doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're going to think it matters, but it doesn't. What matters is the working of your mind. How does my mind work? Now, how do we change the way our mind works? How does someone like me, who grew up getting abused and bullied and all this other stuff, and now he has a predisposed working of mind that says, I need to be on the lookout. I need to watch out. I need to be afraid all the time. So I'm going to produce these chemicals that are anxious. They cause anxiety in my body and that's what my brain does. So that's how it works. But now how do I start to reverse that? Well, first of all, I need to get the things that I can control. Okay. What can I control? I can control my food. I can control what I drink or don't drink. I can control my sleep. I can control some of the social things. 
maybe I can let go of the thought that I need to be the richest person in the room or the smartest or the biggest or the fastest or whatever. Maybe I can let go of those things. Environmental, maybe I can change my environment. If I'm around a bunch of people on Wall Street who are doing coke every day, yeah, I'm going to be anxious. Maybe, you know, don't go to lunch at the coke farm, you know, when you're dealing with that stuff. Um, if I'm around a bunch of drunks, maybe, maybe it's time to change that. So we can change these things and you will start to see your anxiety drop right away, right? When I stopped coffee, it was right away. Boom, there you go. Now, again, disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a trained physician. I'm not a therapist. These are just things that have worked for me. So if you've been drinking a lot, go to the doctor, tell him because detox can be deadly. Now, these are things we can change. Now, how about this working of the mind stuff? Because all this is stuff that affects the working, but it's not like the core. It's not the core makeup of how our brain works. The core makeup of how your brain works is over in this column, okay? What is your life philosophy? What do you believe about life, right? Do you believe other people are better than you? Do you believe uh, the world's bad? Do you believe everything's out to get you? Do you believe that there's always an impending doom somewhere in life? Do you believe that everything's against you? Do you believe that people are gonna come at and get you? Do you believe that there's never enough money, never enough food? Are these things you believe? Because if they are, it's time to change your life philosophy. And you can change your life philosophy to say something like, well, you know, maybe everyone was out to get me when I was a kid, but now I'm okay. Not everyone's out to get me. No one's been out to get me for a long time. I think I'm gonna be okay. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna tell your mind this new story. Because what happens is when we're growing up and even now, when we get a feeling, we tell a story. We get a feeling and it says, ah oh, man, you know what? I got bullied and that felt bad. It hurt my pride, it hurt my feelings, and I was embarrassed. And then you tell yourself a story and you say, well, I must not be worth a damn. If someone could just come up in the middle of gym class and just kick me in the head, and then I get punished for it by the school, well then no one, no one cares about me, right? And that's actually a true story. Um, no one cares about me. And now I used to tell myself the story and said, no one cares about me, no one gives a shit. I must not be worth it, right? And I told myself that story, but that story wasn't true. All it was was telling myself a story because I felt a feeling. Now I can just say, I'm gonna change my life philosophy and I'm gonna change my story. And I can change my story to say that everyone is valued equally, right? Whoever's up there that made us all, made us all equal. And we decide whether we're gonna be nice or mean or good or bad or whatever. Right, and we look at that and we're like, okay, now I can change my philosophy because most people didn't. I went to school, it was a big school. There was 4,000 people at the school. I got bullied by three. And I, I told myself the story that everyone's bullies, everyone's out to get me. And if I look at it logically, I can tell myself a new story and say, well, you know, 3,997 people didn't bully me, but three did. So maybe the story I tell myself is wrong, or when you're looking at coronavirus, right? 0.01% like death rate of the, I don't know, I read it, but it was something like that. It was like the death rate's really low, the amount infected is really low, and we look at it, but people are freaking out, right? Can we look at it logically and say, well, you know, these things tend to happen, and then you say to yourself, well, how do I affect my new life philosophy? What am I gonna do? Well, what we could do is we could start by looking at Stoic philosophy. Stoic philosophy will help your anxiety better than anything I've ever tried. Why? Because it says, how do I, and this is where the serenity prayer comes from. Stoic philosophy, grant me the serenity, serenity, lack of anxiety, right? Serene is not anxious. That's what they're looking for here. Grant me the lack of anxiety to accept the things I can't change. I can't change the coronavirus. Last I checked, I'm not like a physician and I'm not like a guy who can make the vaccine for it. Okay, I can't really affect it. So I can't change that. So do I be anxious about it? No, if I can't do anything, then there's no sense being anxious about it. Right now, if I throw this over here into working a mind and, and let it go for its big spiral, I'm gonna get all sorts of anxious and all sorts of fucked up. That's bad. But if I look at it and I say, well, how do I accept the things I can't change? What can't I change? 
well, I can't really change the virus, but I can wash my hands more or, or avoid big crowded places or whatever. And don't go overboard, obviously, you know, like here in America, there's like, what, 30 cases about, of about 300 million people. So I think we're going to be okay. And we look at it and we're like, okay, what can I change? What can't I change? What about other stuff? Well, we have to learn that in life, in life, there are certain things we can't control. And this is where it gets really silly. People are afraid to fly. Flying, statistically, is way safer than driving across the street. I can't even control what happens to my car on the road. Why? Because I can only drive one car at a time. Right? There's people get excited, they get mad, they get road rage. Why? Because they think they're supposed to control 50 cars on the road instead of the one they're driving. Newsflash, the only one you can control is the one you're driving. Everything else you can't control. Now you could be on the alert and you could be, you know, a little aggressive or whatever they call it. Or uh, defensive driving, I think they call it. But again, we have to look at it and say there's certain things in life I can't control. I can't control the government. Right, I could go vote, but at the end of the day, you know, um, doesn't do a whole lot, right? I'm one of 300 million people. Now it's good to vote. We should do our part, and um, that's good. But I can't change everything. And so what we do is we start to accept things, and we say, well, I accept that this is how our society works, but I also accept that I could be in the world but not of the world. And this is an interesting thing. This is what uh, Jesus talked about in the Bible, if you're into the Bible stuff. He said, how do we be in the world, but not of the world, right? And this, he talks a lot about. It. Actually, there's a lot of verses in the Bible about anxiety. Now, I'm no longer a uh, religious Christian in the normal sense of the word that most people think. Um, I do believe there's a lot of good in the Bible. I believe Jesus said a heck of a lot of good things. Um, so we look at it and we say, a lot of the things Jesus said were about calming of mind. How do we relax? How do we chill out? How do we enter the presence of God where there's no anxiety and there's no stress? Well, the way we're going to do it is by accepting that there's certain things we can't change, certain things we can change, and that life's going to go on no matter what. Because so many times in life, we look at life as happening to us. This happened to me. If I get coronavirus or I run out of money or a relative's mean to me, those are things that happen to me. No, those are things that happen to everyone, right? And, and you probably don't even have it as bad as some. Like I sit here and I'm like, oh man, you know, I didn't make whatever I need to make yesterday, right? There's people out there that didn't get enough to eat yesterday. There's people out there that slept on the road yesterday. And I'm worried because, you know, whatever it is, is not good enough. And we look at it and we say, well, how do we, how do we accept these things? And how do, we, how do we chill out and realize that the working of our brain affects everything? And how do we change the working of our brain? We change it by realizing that in life, there is two things. There's things we can change and things we can't change. I'm going to take care of the stuff I can change because the other stuff, I really can't do. What can't you change? What can't I change? I can't change other people. I can't make other people do what I want. I can't change the economy. I can't change the way viruses happen. I can't change a lot of these things. But what can I do? Well, I can change what I can do, and I can change my part, and I can keep my side of the road clean, and I can look at this and say, well, now that I know that, I'm free. And it's the wisdom of living in an age of insecurity, because there are insecurities all around us. There are things in our life that are going to affect us negative, positive, whatever. There's stuff all around, and a lot of it you can't control, right? There's people that go their entire life, and they say, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to eat everything the doctor says. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to go out. I'm going to be perfect. And they live their life perfect, and at the end of the time, they end up with cancer or something. It's like you can't control that. We can't control We can try to. Obviously, like if I smoke less, I'm probably going to have a less of a chance, but there are certain things we can't control. And what we need to do is we need to live that way, saying what happens happens to everyone. Certain things happen. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And we look at it and we say, these things I can't control. Okay. Next up, we look at acceptance. Okay. 
how can we accept this? Well, if we accept that the working of our mind works a certain way, right? I get anxious when certain things happen. My brain is constantly scanning, looking for things to really, really protect myself. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I go to uh, a meeting or I go to a group and I get anxious and why? Why? And the problem is, is we're always looking for why. This is something that kept me drunk. Why am I drunk? It must be because of X, Y, and Z. Well, you know, maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because of that. Why am I anxious? Why am I drunk? Well, what if the why didn't matter? What if you just accepted it and said, well, I'm anxious because I'm anxious. I'm drunk because I drink. End of story. End of story, right? I don't need to look at it and say, well, my great, 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 great grandmother, twice removed, used to drink uh, back in the old days in her hut. And it's like, well, what good does that do? Well, I drink because I was abused. No, you drink because you're an alcoholic. That's why you drink if you're in that category. I'm anxious because of this. Okay, fine, good, whatever. You're anxious because the working of your mind is now anxious. That's the way it works. No, 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 you don't understand because when I talk to my dad, I get anxious. I talk to my mom or my brother, I get anxious. Not really. You get anxious because you get anxious. Those just happen to be the things you're anxious about right now. So we look at it and we say, how do we accept this? Well, we accept it and we say, that's the way my mind works. And you sit there and you get anxious and you go, well, I guess my brain's just being a little anxious. And it's going to want to go and say, well, it's because of this guy, that guy over there with the funny hat. I shouldn't have a funny hat on. I'm going to be anxious about funny hat guy. And you say, well, no, I'd be anxious if he had a weird hairdo too. I'd be anxious about anything because an anxious mind can always find things to be anxious about. And when you accept it and you say, well, I guess that's the way my mind works for now. What's going to happen is acceptance is going to turn off the fight. Because so many people are fighting anxiety. They're fighting. They're saying, I'm anxious and I don't want to be anxious. I'm anxious and I'm struggling with anxiety. What am I going to do? And you try to fight it. And you try to make it go away and it never works. Maybe once in a while you might get a little breakthrough and it'll go away. But most of the time when you fight it, it's not going to work because you can't fight the working of your mind. If you got OCD and you try to fight it, guess what? You're going to have more OCD. If you have anxiety and you try to fight it, guess what? You're going to have more anxiety. If you're an alcoholic and you try to fight it, guess what? You're probably going to drink more alcohol. But when you accept and you say, this is the way it is. I drink. I'm an alcoholic. I accept that. Now what? I'm anxious. I can't sit still. Now what? Okay, now I know that's going on. I know that if I drink, I'm going to get drunk. That's what I do. Historically, that's what I do. So now that I accept this, I could sit back and say, well, I don't have to fight it anymore because now I've accepted it. I've accepted it. I said, oh, this is the way my mind works. And what's going to happen is you're going to start to create new paths for your thoughts to go down in your brain. And what happens is like this, where it trains your brain to think a certain way, right? Your brain goes, oh, here's this bad dude. I need to produce this chemical here that's gonna make me run. Bad guy run, bad guy run, bad guy run. It happens so many times. And then all of a sudden, you see a guy and you, you wanna run. And you go, I don't know why I wanna run. Well, it's because this path was lit up, right? Same thing with alcohol. You say, well, you know, I feel bad if I drink alcohol, it'll probably help. And so many times you went, I, I felt bad, I drank, felt bad, drank, felt bad, drank, felt bad, drink, felt bad, drink, felt bad. And now I just go, feel bad, drink. You know, it's automatic, it's like a, a, a next thing, feel bad, drink. Um, feel anxious, need to run. And it's going to produce the chemicals and it's going to pr produce the stuff. But the cool thing is, is we can start to change this. We can start to accept this is the way it is. It might take a while to change, but I'm not going to fight it, right? If I sit here and I'm like, don't go down that path. Don't go down. Oh man, I thought about drinking. I, I felt bad and I thought about drinking. That's terrible me. I better go get drunk. No, you felt bad about drinking because you're a drunk and you, you, that's the way it is, right? You don't feel bad about it. You just sit there and say, that's the way it is. Or if I sit in a place and I have anxiety, why do I have anxiety? This is terrible. What am I going to do? Well, you're just going to sit there and you're going to have anxiety and you'll be okay. 
Why? Because you always are. You always are. And then when you accept it, it's going to start to go away. And you're going to start to build new, healthier pathways. Now, when you build these new, healthy pathways, the old ones don't go away. Okay? They're, they're always going to be there. You might say, oh, man, I had a real bad day. I should probably go drink. Okay? But the new one's going to say, well, last time you drank, it wasn't so good. I mean, you know, that's a... Might have felt better for about 10 minutes, but remember like, waking up in the gutter and, and feeling real bad? All right, instead, why don't you take a walk? Or instead, why don't you go to a meeting? Or instead, why don't you uh, eat something or get some sleep? And these new pathways are going to start to happen. And when these new pathways happen, the working of your mind starts to change. And it's almost by magic. And we look at it and we can be calm. And we can have the knowledge we need to get through this. And we can accept it. And sometimes you might be going along like with me. My anxiety has been pretty low for the last three, five, three to four years, right? Um, sometimes it peaks. And I can look at that and I can get all messed up and say, hey, you know what? I had a bad anxiety day. I'm, I'm back here, right? And I could keep going down those old paths or I could get the new ones and say, hey, this new one worked out pretty good for me. I think I'm going to be okay. Even though today was a bad day, I think it's going to be okay. And we could start to look at this and say, well, my mind works anxiously because I'm kind of anxious. And that's the way it goes. Let's go ahead and go to the comments and questions we have. I know we have a lot of them through my little talk today. If you like this talk, give us a thumbs up. And we're going to go ahead and take some of these comments. Um, I don't have Terry today, so we will try to get some of these. Uh, hi to Jessica, Derek, Ty, Steve, uh, Trevelin, Rena, Anno, Baby, uh, One Man's Way. Okay, Stephen says, we can only have one thought at a time. Need to monitor our thoughts and replace the negative ones instantly. Otherwise, they roll into more bad ones, like rationalizing why I should pick up now. Well, Steve, what I would do also is, is accept it. Like, hey, bad thoughts aren't the end of the world. Bad thoughts are only bad if you act on them. Right? Like, if I think, oh, you know what, I'm going to go punch a wall, okay, that, that thought means nothing. It's a chemical impulse in the brain. That's all it is. Like if I watch too much TV murder mysteries and I have too much coffee, I'm going to be up at four o'clock thinking about murdering mysteries and weird stuff. Why? Because that's what I fed my brain and it's chemically altered by the coffee and that's what I'm going to get. It's not bad or good. It's just the way it is. And now what do I do? All right now what do I do? Let's take a look at some others here. Okay. Thanks, Marcus. I really needed the refresher course. Kind of perfect timing. You like the Bud Light flowers. Uh, Alan Watts. Yeah, Alan Watts is a great speaker. I like his stuff. Um, Danny says, I know you speak the truth. I'm still struggling even now as you speak, spilling more than I drink. All right, well, Danny, what I would do is I would go to a doctor and tell him how much you've been drinking and say, I, I want to quit. Um, because when you detox off of alcohol, it, it could be deadly. So you got to go to the doctor. Now, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a trained physician, not a therapist. Um, but what I do know is when you're detoxing off of alcohol, it can be deadly, even though you don't think that um, it can be. So I would definitely go to the doctor. Uh, Danny goes on to say, what's the answer? What is the answer to stop hard when your body's addicted? Well, the cool thing about this is the body and mental addiction stops like the, the withdrawal symptoms stop after about like five to seven days, I think it is. And after that, it's all mind stuff, right? So if you could deal with the physical stuff, go to the doctor, deal with the physical stuff for five, seven, 10 days, whatever they recommend, then come back and say, now I'm, how am I going to combat this mentally? How am I going to deal with drinking? How am I going to accept I'm an alcoholic and that when I pick up a drink, I end up getting drunk? Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but I know that when I drink, it chemically alters the way my mind works and therefore I have no control over what I do, what I say, what I think, what I feel, and I live in a world of delusion. I lived in a world of delusion for so long, first because of anxiety and because I thought I was at war with my mind. I thought that I had to control my mind. And then I sat back and I asked myself, what the fuck is my mind anyway? I've never seen it. What is this thing that I call mind? And I acted like my mind was controlling everything. And my mind controlled what I did. And then I realized that I could have thoughts without being the thinker. 
what if I have thoughts? What if I just have these thoughts and these thoughts are not me? Now, I know there's people that will say, well, Marcus doesn't say in the Bible, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, I don't know if that necessarily means that you are your thoughts as much as what you think about is probably going to come to pass because you're thinking about it a lot, right? Like the people who think, I'm going to get sick, I'm going to get sick, I'm going to get sick, they always get sick. My uncle was like that. He'd come over, you know, in like body armor if we ever got sick. And he'd be like, I'm, I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get... And no matter what, the guy could have been in a, like a, a, a suit and not gotten any germs and he'd still get sick. And then maybe you could argue that his mind made him sick. But I started to realize that my mind wasn't everything. I realized that these thoughts can be controlled. And to show you that your thoughts can be controlled... Most of you guys who are English speaking, your thoughts are in the English language. Did you invent the English language? No. So what is a thought? All right, let's look at what a thought is. Well, a thought, thought, okay? A thought is words to explain something, right? I didn't sit here and come up with the word pen. Although right now I'm thinking about a pen. How many of you guys are thinking about a pen right now? You might be thinking about the red pen, the blue one, or don't think about the purple one, right? Don't think about the purple pen. How many of you guys are thinking about a pen right now? Right? Is everyone thinking about a pen? And I got to scroll down to see that, right? You're thinking about a pen. Why? Because that got put in your brain. I deliberately put that thought into your brain. You're thinking, pen, pen, pen. Why can't I stop thinking about a freaking pen? What the hell's the matter with me? Well, that was put in your brain. You didn't invent the word. Now, a thought is something that happens. Now, usually it starts as a feeling. Now, before language, we just have feelings. We'd be like, man, that feels bad. I'm going to stay away from that. That feels good. I'm going to go towards that. Uh, I saw my cousin get eaten by a woolly mammoth. So... I'm going to stay away from those. And that's what happened in life before thoughts, right? And we didn't have them. Now, what thoughts are is they are like software. That's my CD, right? We'll do uh, DOS 5.0 or whatever, right? They are software for your brain. That's what it is. Now, if you know anything about software, you know that software controls everything. Is the software the computer, right? Here's your computer. You got your button here all this other crap, right? Is the software actually the computer? No, the computer is this box with all this stuff. The software is what makes the computer work the way it does. So if you have like Mac or DOS or Linux or Windows, that says Windows, right? Or Windows, that's going to affect the way that this works. Now, language is our operating system. Okay, that's what it is. Now, there are other cultures, like in other cultures, they have like 50 words for different ones that we only have one word for. Why? Well, they explain it different. They have a different software. They have a different working. Now, here in Western culture, Western, our operating system is kind of screwed up. It says you got to have a lot of money. You got to have this. You got to have that. You got to have a nice house. You got to drive this car. You got to be this way. You got to be this certain way. And it also says... You need to drink because everyone else is drinking and you're just a loser if you don't drink. Is that a flaw in you or is that a flaw in the software? Is it a flaw in the software? Right? So we look at this and we're like, okay, well, if I'm over here and the software is over here doing its stuff and I'm blaming everything on me. Oh, it's me. I'm bad computer, bad computer, terrible. Well, maybe not. Maybe there's a bug in the software. And if you're an alcoholic and you have anxiety and you have all these things, there's a bug in the software. And if you accept that, you can go in and say, well, I can't really change that, but what I can do is something else. I can do something different, right? So when we look at that, we gotta really, really look at it and focus, okay? Very important. All right, let's take a look at some others here. Thanks so much for addressing this, the isolation too. Yes, isolation uh, for alcoholics and anxious people is terrible. Get out. Even if you're anxious, get out, talk to people, uh, go to a meeting, go to a group, go to wherever, uh, but get out and talk to people because that's going to help. And it might be daunting at first, 
but over time it'll get better and know that, hey, you know what, if I go to a meeting or a group or talk to some old friends or whatever, it's not going to kill me. I'm going to be okay. I've done it before. Okay, uh, Quizzy says, now that I'm sober, it feels like a lot of people disagree for me being this way, but when I'm getting out of my mind, everything was cool. Or when I was getting out of mine, I, I think that's what that says. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, find people who agree with you. Like, if you're sober and you want people to agree with you, go to, like, a sober meeting or a group of people who don't drink. All right, they'll agree with you. Okay, nine weeks sober. Congrats, Marks. Uh, pity talk is a squatty potty. It can be. I mean, yeah, I mean, when you pity yourself or you get down on yourself, what you're doing is you're just getting down on the software. Change the software. Change the way it works. Right? This software was it was put on you and it could be changed whenever you want. You can go through and say, well, what am I going to do? How do you change the software? Get new thoughts. You want to change the software, get new thoughts. Why? Because this software is put in by other people's thoughts. You didn't sit there as a baby and say, I'm afraid of... Think about this. So when you were a baby, you didn't think to be afraid of public speaking. If I took you as a baby and took you to a football game and went down on the field and I had to sing the national anthem, which no one wants me to do, I suck at singing, and I'd get nervous. I would get so nervous I probably wouldn't even be able to sing. Why? Because I have a fear of public speaking. The baby is going to howl and make noises and doesn't even care. Doesn't even care how many people are out there. So the fear of public speaking was something other thoughts put into your software, right? Because you're only born with two fears, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. That's it. Everything else is learned. So you learned all these old thoughts, and these old thoughts aren't working for you. They're making you anxious. They're making you drunk. They're screwing up your life. So what do you do? You get new thoughts. Now, you can't get new thoughts and put them on an old drive. You got to get the new thoughts and put them on new stuff. And you got to say, well, what, if, what am I not going to accept? I'm not going to accept that I'm bad or I'm a loser or something's wrong with me. I'm not going to accept that. I am going to accept this new one that says, well, maybe it's my operating system. Maybe something's messed up. Maybe I need to rewrite this part of the software. Maybe I need to change it. And the way that you do that is by getting other people's thoughts, like listening to this talk here. You're getting new thoughts from me, hopefully. And you can take those and say, well, you know, I looked at this stuff and, and it makes sense. And I'm, I'm going to change that old story, that story that says everyone's out to get me. Life sucks. It's terrible. Into, hey, life doesn't suck for a lot of people. What are they doing that I'm not? Right? You want results? Go to someone who has the results and say, what the fuck are you doing? I want to do that. Right? Same thing I learned in business. You want to get rich? Go to a guy who's rich and say, hey, buddy, how'd you get rich? And he'll tell you. And you follow the path and you get rich. Right now, there's going to be obstacles. There's things. There's luck. There's, you know, uh, other stuff going on. But for the most part, you can get that. You want to get sober? You say, well, who's, who's been sober for a while? And how do I follow that? What did he do? Look at what people do. Okay, far too often, we look at what people say. And we're like, well, that guy says this. Well, who cares what people say? Look at what they do. Okay, did the guy stay sober 5, 10, 20, 50 years? Good. What did he do? Well, he listens to talks every day. He um, reads new stuff. He stays away from the bar. He doesn't get alcohol at the store. He goes to meetings. What does he do that gets him sober? Guy has anxiety and it went away. What did he do? What did he do that changed it, right? And we look at this, we focus on what we do. Okay, let's take some other ones here. Anno says, addiction is a progressive disease. Even if you're abstinent, addiction is making push-ups outside. Yes, it does get stronger. It's like what I wrote here on our first page, right? Up here, we said the neural pathways don't get erased. They're just there. And they're, they never get, like, less strong, okay? So if you get thrown for a loop, it's going to get just as strong as before, okay? So it doesn't go away. It's there. That's why we have to be active against our anxiety and active against our addiction. 
Let's take some other questions here. Ano says, my thoughts won't kill me, but trying to ignore them with alcohol will. Yes, alcohol definitely can kill you. It's very dangerous for the alcoholic to continue drinking. Danny, I don't know how I'm getting a retirement check. I was great at my job, but almost lost it because of my alcoholic behavior. No DUIs or assaults, thank God. Well, glad you're doing okay now. Uh, now it's time to get sober. One Man's Way says deep breathing resets the mind and lowers anxiety. Yes, it does. Also, different thoughts when you breathe, listening to different talks, uh, music frequencies. Uh, you'll find stuff that works for you. For me, uh, if I know I'm going to be anxious, I'll listen to like Alan Watts or Ram Dass or something like that. Steve said, I accepted that I couldn't have just one drink. That was all only the beginning. Absolutely. Unhappiness builds depression. Alcohol is my first friend. Lots of loneliness builds anxiety. Well, um, loneliness might build anxiety because you're isolating, and obviously when you go out and not isolate, like you go to the bank or the store or something, you might be anxious. But I would say that alcohol is probably causing your anxiety and stopping you from doing the things that will get you away from it. So I would look at that, and I would really blame the alcohol for what the alcohol is doing. Far too many times, alcohol gets off too easy. I don't know why, but the, like, it just gets off too easy. And we say, oh, well, that's not because of that. Usually because we want to keep drinking. But when we look at it and we say, no, alcohol's fucking up my life. It's not working for me. What am I going to do instead? What am I going to do? How am I going to change these things? Okay. Um, let's see. Spoke with you guys over a month ago, went to a place, accepted my longtime problem of having a drinking problem, now 29 days sober. Congratulations, Cody. That's awesome. 29 days is huge. Um, one man's way, nine months sober, but I still need a software update. Uh, yeah, I would definitely watch the video we have on this channel that is about um, a dry drunk. Very, very important topic. A lot of disagreement we had, a lot of agreement we had with it too. Um, but it talks about what's it like to be sober with the old software, right? And then how to change that software. That's definitely a good one. Weird how chemicals can drive our thoughts and create so many real sensations. Absolutely. And this is something you got to look at is that chemicals can change you. Very important. Uh, coffee before food for me is a disaster. Had coffee this morning without breakfast. Felt fine. My mom calls and shares bad news about a friend of the family. Anxiety. Yeah. And, you know, um, realize that. I'm anxious because I got coffee. Big deal. It'll, it'll pass. Knowing that things will pass is, is a big key. Uh, Quezzy says, it sounds to me like automatic negative thinking. Yeah, that's what happens is you get, you get programmed to automatic negative thinking. Um, and when we focus on this, we got to say, hey, I accept this. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, Kevin asked where Terry is. Terry is uh, doing some stuff on his house. He's moving soon. Um, so I'm flying solo today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you did, give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell. And we'll take a couple last minute questions if you have any. And then we'll wrap up for the day. Hopefully you guys liked the training today. More of a lecture style. And hopefully you'll start to understand that anxiety is not something to fight with. And it's not something to, to control. It's something to accept and move through. Right? You accept it. And you say, that's just the way it is. I'm going to be okay. I don't need to fight it. I don't need to drink it away. I can just be here. And one of my favorite books is Be Here Now by Ram Dass. It's a crazy-ass book, really weird. I got it up here on the shelf somewhere. Um, but he teaches you that being in the moment, because anxiety is about future and past. You're anxious about the future. I might get this virus. I might lose my job. I might this. Or you're anxious about the past. And when you're in the future or the past, you can't live now. Right? You can't live now. And the focus is to live now. Jade says, 237 days and walked away from a very tempting slip while trying to help another alcoholic get sober. Glad I'm here today. Well, we're glad you're here today too, Jade. Uh, 237 days is huge, and I'm glad you're able to walk away from that. That's proof that you're building new neural pathways and you're, you're learning new ways, and you're learning that getting drunk doesn't work. And getting drunk fuels all that crap on the other page that makes our lives all screwed up. And when we look at this and we understand it, right? We don't have to get mad. Like, oh, I almost slept. Man, I'm terrible. I must suck at this sober thing. No. You know, you look at it and you're like, yeah, of course your brain went there. You drank thousands of times and it, you know, did what it did thousands of times. 
and that neural pathway is still there. But you know what, old neural pathway? You can fuck off. I'm going to take this new one. And you look at that and you say, that's how my brain, now I understand how my brain works. Because unfortunately in high school, and I don't know if you learned it in college, maybe if you took the right classes, we don't really understand how the mind works, right? We study disorders and we're like, oh, here's this disorder and we're going to fix this disorder. And here's this anxiety. We're going to fix this. But we never really look at how the mind works. How does your brain work? Right? You go ask a psychologist, like, where's my, where's my mind? And he's like, oh, what the hell? I don't know. Do you have OCD? He's like, no, where's my mind? He's not going to know where your mind is. Why? Because your mind's software. Right? Where's, where's the software in the computer? I don't know. I put the disk in and now it's just on there. Right? And we look at it and it's like, let's start understanding this. Because thousands of years ago, cultures would look at it and they'd understand this stuff. And they got it. And they're like, wow. Okay, I get how this works. And now we're just you know, kind of like, oh, I got this, I got this, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to fix that, instead of accepting. Danny says, um, being a drunk is selfish. I've missed so much time with my family, grandkids, baseball games, etc. putting booze and cigarettes first. I realize now what you're saying. I'm going to seek out a local AA. Awesome. And also realize that, um, you know, to an extent, being drunk is selfish. Yes, it is. But also you're chemically altered. Right? This is the thing people don't accept. They're like, oh, I was drunk because my family. I was drunk because this. I'm drunk because of this. I'm drunk because... No, you're drunk because alcohol makes you drunk. And now all this other stuff's coming up and you're breaking all these excuses, but alcohol screws you up chemically. Right? If I was to take you and put you in a room with bright light and not let you sleep, not let you eat, all you could do is drink coffee, you'd pretty much go insane. That's what's going to, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the Pope. I don't care if you're Gandhi. I don't care if you're like the strongest weightlifter in the world. If you're in the room long enough, this is like waterboarding and stuff. This is why waterboarding is illegal and should be illegal. Why? Because with waterboarding, they're manipulating people's mind. They are screwing them up chemically. And those people will probably never be the same again. Same thing with alcohol. You're screwing yourself chemically and you're sitting there. You're like the guy being waterboarded and you're like, damn it, why do I feel bad? Damn it, why can't I sleep? Well, because they're fucking with your mind. That's why you can't sleep. That's why that's against the law. With alcohol, the same things happen. Why am I not able to deal with this? Why am I selfish? Why am I an asshole? Well, hopefully you're an asshole just because you're drunk and you're not just an asshole. That's a whole nother story for a whole nother thing. And we talk about that in the dry drunk video, but hopefully changing your life philosophy will help with that. But we look at it and we're like, if anyone drank as much as I drank, they would have done what I did and been who I was. That's what alcohol does. It's what it does. And you're sitting here going, well, it's because of this. If I dealt with my shit with my mom, I wouldn't be a drunk. Bullshit. Deal with the alcohol because that's what's screwing you up. That's what's chemically altering everything. Okay. Jade says, thanks for this talk, Marcus. Really needed it. Thanks for helping us find new thoughts. Awesome. Glad you're here. Uh, hard to accept it, but this Cody, hard to accept it, but we got to face it. Forgive ourselves and respect the process of recovery and our past faults. Well said. Donna, lightning bolt moment with this talk. I think alcohol gave me a tendency to finger point. I'm going to wait to determine a problem of uh, being a spouse until... I've been sober for at least two months. Yeah, you know, deal with the, the alcohol thing. And things are going to change. Like, I thought that when I got sober, I was going to have to sit and deal with X, Y, Z, deal with all these problems. And I got sober and I'm like, well, shit, where did all my problems go? Now, there were still some. Like, I had some financial problems because, you know, when you drink, you don't make the wisest money mistakes, right? Um, I had some family problems. I had some stuff. But it wasn't nearly as big as it was. Why? Because alcohol made me think it was bad. Why? Because that was an excuse to go drink more alcohol. What does alcohol want? More alcohol. What does anxiety want? More stuff to be anxious about. What does OCD want? More stuff to be OCD about. But if I say, you know what? I'm not playing anymore. I'm done. I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to drink and screw up my mind and wonder why my mind screw up and drink and wonder why my life sucks. and wonder I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sit here and be anxious and wonder why I'm anxious and try to find this and try to do this and drink and do this. I'm not, I'm not going to play, right? I throw the bat down and I say, I'm not playing this game because it's rigged against me. 
So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to accept this. I'm going to say, now, I'm going to make my own game. And in getting rid of anxiety and getting over alcohol is about making a new game. Here's a game I'm going to deal with. Here's the things I can control. Here's the things I can't control. And here's what I'm going to do in my life. Thanks again for watching, guys. Subscribe, click the bell, give us a thumbs up and lots of comments. It helps more people see this video. So the more thumbs up we get, I think they're called likes, uh, the more people see this. So thanks again for being here. Stay sober and uh, see you next time. Go over to TalkSober.com and support the channel if you like what we're doing.